Okay, so you asked me um, a comment for like the women's rights. Yeah. Well, honestly, <clears throat> I'm all for it, and um, I mean it's like it's pretty self-explanatory. Any anybody should have their rights. There well, shouldn't be. And actually, you have to comment on what you read for the day. Um, let me. What about Mary Wollstonecraft? What about Martha Nussbaum? What about John Stuart Mill? Um, hold on, let me go, let me try to find where it is. Okay, so I'll just call on Michael. Michael? Oh uh, yeah, so the first point that I had was, um, I took a quote that says, a rational and just person will think of God as also rational and just. An irrational and impulsive person will think of God as irrational and impulsive, um, which this wasn't directly related uh, to women's rights, my other two points are more so. Um, but I thought that this quote was interesting because it, it almost um, it almost had the idea that like we kind of emulate what we want like out of religion, um, and and that like uh, which like we've we've talked about how like the interpretation of religious texts can lead to um, you know very different ideologies and whatnot. Um, but I thought that that was interesting um, when you break it down more so into a person's. Um, just kind of their like their emotions almost just being able to handle themselves. Yeah, I mean, don't a lot of religious leaders aren't they kind of judgmental? So they would quote the Old Testament, but that's not what Jesus said, right? That's one example. But somebody else, do you ever feel like Hold on. Zane? Oh, I was just going to say, like, that's what I was going to kind of say, like, add on to that, is it kind of point out to me, like, where it said, uh, they try to, you know, like, justify it by, you know, trying to make, you know, quotes out of the Bible and stuff like that, and that just kind of, like, you're talking about how, like, tying, in, tying that into, like, the other weeks, and, you know, just, you know, like, also what Michael says, how they done, like, religious leaders have done that with... Okay, you got to slow down, Zane, and you got to lean right into your microphone. My bad, my bad, I'm outside. Uh, so, yeah, it's kind of like what Michael said, like, a bunch of, like, the... Uh, religious leaders have been trying or you know previously try to like get uh quotes out of the bible and scripture to like justify things such as women's rights and you know why that shouldn't be and then like also racism and stuff like that but uh i was just gonna say like what you said about like tying things into like the different weeks i guess that kind of ties into it okay good Well, just going off, can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. Well, just going off of that, like what Michael was saying about you kind of make religion or things that you see in life to what like your mindset is at. So like it's like confirmation bias. Like if you're already in a negative mindset, like you're going to see things that people do and they could say something and it could be interpreted in two different ways. But if you're already in a negative mindset or you're looking for something to critique or whatever, or you're trying to look for the best in somebody, then it's going to like, you're going to interpret it in the way that you're already, your mindset is at. Um, and I think one of the issues too, with just like in the Bible in particular, or at least like when people talk about the Bible, like quote the Bible, is that they usually have not read the Bible. And I'm not going to like say you have to read the whole entire Bible because I'm on my own quest to read the Bible. And it's really hard to interpret. Like you have to look at the other translations. Like right now I'm in Romans and that is so hard to read. <laughs> But what I noticed that is a lot of people take quotes from the Bible and it's totally like mis like I'm not gonna say misinterpreted, but like totally taken out of its context. Like they'll quote it, but they don't say what else is going on around that quote. So then it just seems a certain way. And so I think like that's one of the issues that people have. And that's where they can like, I guess, frame religion or frame God in the way that they want to see it. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> read it in the original Hebrew. Yeah. Jordan, did you read it in the original Hebrew? Um, I translate certain sections of it or it was required. Um, because I I can't read it. I can't speak or uh read Hebrew, but um like direct translations of things are very different. Um, uh, especially from the King James version of the Bible. A lot of like like the original story of Adam and Eve um, was a little different. I, I don't, according to some places, it wasn't even in the Bible before uh, 
for the King James Version. It was <laughs> written and specifically to subjugate women. Yeah, okay. Uh, we don't have to do just the religion thing. We can do whatever you brought to class based on your reading. But we can if you want. It's just so far nobody has mentioned Mary Wollstonecraft's argument based on religion. But go ahead. Who wants to go? I can go, but I did not pick to comment off of that. I my main thing I wanted to comment on was the John Stuart Mill's thesis and that paper. Um, so reading the direct quote from the beginning, the principle which regulates the existing social relations between two races, the legal subword, and like we could like read it on, and it goes, separation between one race and another is wrong in itself. Social hindrances, like basically it's saying how like the way the world is separating men from women or black from white, from brown to white is putting a hindrance on our, our improvement of our, sorry, I have like a major headache and that's why I was late. I might stop for a second, but um, um, it was just saying how like that in itself is the reason why we are so further back than other places like japan has robots checking its people into hotels and we don't even we don't even have anything close to that so that just stood out to me and how maybe if we got rid of the power like if we got rid of like non-equality and like got gave equality or got rid of privilege it would be, um, it wouldn't be, oh, women's rights are so important because we didn't have them. Well, for some places, women's are, women are more important than men in uh, some standards. So they don't have that issue. So in other sorry, words, you saying? society would flourish if people were given equal opportunity? Yes, ma'am. And why aren't they? I don't know. I find it so. Oh, sorry. It's okay. You can go. Or I can finish. Um, um, I think a lot of people, like we said before, it's just fear. Fear of being replaced fear of another i was just saying that like that's a good point oh okay it's fine um i think i mainly just think it's fear like we said before well do politic do politicians take advantage of fear and come up with the whole rhetorical worldview that's false but it's based on fear and it works Absolutely. They take advantage of the little things and the, um, the way people see and like the little things people see and how it scares them. I know um, when my brother went to Afghanistan and it was the all the get the soldiers home, bring them home. I texted my brother. I said, do you want to come home? He said, no, I'm good. I said, okay, see you at Christmas. Hung up the phone. And then the whole, and then the whole bringing them back, making sure they got back and then putting them back in because everyone was scared. Afghan Tal Taliban was coming back. That was all because of misinterpretation and misconception. And I think with the not people not being equal, it's the same thing. I think one thing too is um, certain people when they're oppressed, like they get comfortable with it. Like a lot of people bring up like white feminists and how even though they've been oppressed by feminism, they've also benefited from like their race. And um, 
what's it called? And then um, they alienate them against other women just because um, if more like equal rights are given, they're gonna lose some of their freedoms that they think of. Like, I had it in my head. I cannot remember. You mean, do you mean white anti-feminists? Yes, yes, that's yeah, what I meant. Okay. It's just um, like, you know, they're made out, uh, the feminists to them are made out to be like villains that are gonna come and ruin their comfortable life that they have. And so like, they end up getting in the way of things that would um, be benefiting them even more just because they fear it will ruin their comfortableness. Um, to, to kind of go off of that, um, one of the points that I made, um, I took a quote that said, even though women have often accepted such treatment when their environments and culture have molded them to accept it, it's not difficult through education for women to come to the rational recognition that such treatment violates the right to have a decent life. Um, when I talk about, I, I feel like we see this a lot in many different instances of oppression. Um, this, the, the idea of just sitting down, laying down um, because you're being oppressed and, uh, and it can be easy to like, to just go ahead and do that. And cause you know, you are being oppressed. Um, but this kind of brought it like to my attention that in some instances um, that like the oppression is so deep that you don't even realize you're being oppressed. Like you, you may not, you perhaps you're not being educated because you're oppressed. And so you have no idea that you are even being oppressed. You know, you don't even know like where to start because you have no clue that there's anything wrong. Who hasn't spoken yet? Erin? Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, Jordan, go ahead. Okay. I was gonna comment what Alexis was talking about earlier is like, I think new age feminism is more about intersectionality, which is so important in advancing as a society. Like what she was talking about, which, adding, which is uh, women who benefited on the right privilege that they had and didn't want to see a difference in that because they would still privilege off it in sense. Well, there's also the fact that there are there's a privileged number of women who never really experience discrimination, but they don't notice, so they don't identify, they don't have empathy with the women who do. Does that make sense, Jordan? they just think women are whiners <laughs> right and that happens with race too there's a few people who can sort of get through the system without a lot of obstacles and then they think well if i can do it anybody can do it um i don't know aaron do you have something I got from this is about like it talks about it's kind of, I'm kind of what the um, other people have been talking about about like the religion aspect about just how religion has been used in the past to and now to basically hinder women to a point where they're basically essentially just like housewives and now like as they've gotten more rights, as like women have gotten more rights, like you've seen like women choose to like not forego childbirth and like pursue careers and everything. And I think like, I don't know, I think we're seeing progress. And I okay, so I think I will go back to the arguments and I want you all to address the argument, right? The argument of the paper. And so I'll call on you as soon as I run through it. Um, let's see. Now, you know, I have this all set up and then, okay, here we go. So here's the uh, argument of the paper. Let's see, here we go. All right. Well, I would like you to comment on the United Nations capability model. This is a model used for international development. 
Um, again, I don't know how many of you watched the pre-class video. Um, I'm okay. So none of your comments seem to address the very much the things that you read or whatever what in the video. But okay, so I compared this to Aristotle's capabilities. Now there's obviously a lot of differences. But the basic idea is we have these natural capabilities and we need to, they need to be activated or we can't be fully human. So obviously life and then bodily health and bodily integrity, that all relates to temperance, uh, self-control and relationship to eating, drinking and sex, but also being able to be healthy, being able to not be assaulted, um, things like that. So the next one is being able to use your senses. Now, this is this is a, a key factor in what some of you mentioned was that sexism and racism also, they're a huge hindrance to the exercise of rational freedom, rational freedom, right? Just the ability to have your own mind to think out loud about what's on your mind, to communicate with other people, to be able to use your mind in ways that um, are creative, right? You have artistic expression, scientific inquiry, uh, creating your own worldview, figuring out how to live, just talking to other people about how to live. In an authoritarian society, you can't do that. You have, you know, people are truly thwarted because they do want to understand stuff. They do want to talk about stuff. Um, and that's what women are denied. And African Americans were denied that, uh, along with the basic, you know, food, clothing, and shelter. But this other stuff matters. Uh, being able to have attachments to people, obviously. Um, practical reasons. So the argument in this paper is that it looks like practical reason is esoteric, just a bunch of talking heads, just a bunch of privileged people in their, in their offices or whatever. And so my argument is that the definition of women, if you define them as not completely capable of reason as intellectually not as advanced as men. That's a philosophy and that structures every aspect of society. So that is why you get deprived of education. That's why you can't get a job. That's why you don't get to vote. That's why, right? It, there's one reason. <laughs> And it explains all this other stuff that you actually encounter in life. Um, so sexism is in a lie. It's the wrong conception of the good. And so is racism uh, because women and non-whites are equally capable of the highest levels of rational thought. So that means in order to be happy, they need the opportunity to exercise rational freedom, just like everybody else. Um, affiliation, we are social and political creatures by nature. And the UN tries to root out all sorts of discrimination. And you know, if it's a global uh, effort, there is a lot of it <laughs> around the world. Also sustainability, the United Nations is very much into sustainability. Um, recreation is important for your sanity. You need to take time out. Um, control over your environment. So you be, should be able to have be an engaged citizen and you should be able to have property rights. Now, the thing that's interesting here is that according to the UN, the last thing on the list is property and money. And you can make the argument that the whole global economic system is driven by profit. And that explains why the rich keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer. And there is all sorts of unnecessary suffering 
because the system is driven by greed rather than by the desire for human flourishing. And that's why I think the United Nations makes a contribution to global culture. Um, all right, so the, let's see. All right, so here's the argument, Mary Wollstonecraft's argument. First of all, I want you to react to the United Nations capabilities, right? I want you to have one reaction there, and now I want a reaction to her argument. Um, if religion says you have to live virtuously to be saved, and you have to use your reason in order to be virtuous, and you have to be educated to train your reason to know how to be to, to make the right judgments, then reason must be a gift by, uh, from God, right? It's like, it's like the guidebook for how to use your free will, right? You don't just give someone free will and, and don't give them reason and it's a crapshoot and then they damn themselves and you get to send them to hell, okay? What is reason? The power to transcend your experiences and your emotions. Um, so when you discriminate against women in education, you're denying them moral responsibility for their actions if they're not capable of acting morally because they don't have reason or you know and you're not educating them and then in a way if you say women don't have reason like they're base they're emotional they're impulsive basically you're you're condemning them to eternal damnation and if you think women have an immortal soul so i you know, it's like that would be a pretty awful view of God. Ah, I'm going to greet these women. <laughs> ah, they're going to roast. So, you know, it doesn't make any sense on a religious worldview to think that women are not to discriminate against women because they must have reason because that's the only way we can avoid damnation. Um, so all governments that deny women equal education are unjust. It just follows from that. Um, when you have reason, you control your emotions to set goals. And um, women are denied those opportunities. They don't have any reason to control themselves. So in addition to that, um, women are less, women aren't as good of mothers because if women model, if mothers model impulsive behavior, then the children learn to be impulsive. So an educated woman would be a better mother, an educated woman would be a better spouse because marriage should be based on friendship um, once the sexual attraction sort of wanes. And, um, Educated women would expect marriages to evolve into friendships because you'd be friends based on your reasoning capacities and your discussions. Uh, educated women, uh, you need to educate women so they can think about politics, even if they can't vote. But of course, they should be able to vote. But they should, they, everyone is able to think like a citizen. So they need education. Um, they're less educated women are less likely to be duped by religious charlatans. All right. So why do we why do we read Wollstonecraft? Because the arguments are still true. We have some of the same problems and the same solutions. And practical wisdom is at the root of oppression. So on the one hand, it shows the power of the external environment to mold people. But on the other hand, it shows the limits. Because every time a little girl is born or a little black kid is born and they, when they're little, they can figure out, I'm just as smart as that white kid or that boy, that white boy, you know? I know I'm just as smart as him. I know I can run just as fast as him, you know? And then they see that the boys or the white boys get an advantage and, and that, you know, it doesn't wash. You're never going to have a stable society when it's based on a, a lie because you can't destroy ba people's basic 
intuition. Um, okay, so what about developing countries in India? Um, she has a very similar argument. I think it's really interesting. Um, even today, you have this notion of modesty. Women have to be modest. Well, obviously, the Taliban would uh, say that that's why they should never get educated. They shouldn't even leave the house unless they're completely covered. Um, but if you educate women or if you educate African Americans, then they can recognize their natural equality and then they'll start to demand equal treatment under the law. Um, and religion often in the world today leads to the denial of women's rights. So again, to even today, uniting reason and faith is the best tool for meaningful and, and permanent change because most people in the world still identify with some kind of religious tradition. Um, and I want to point out that when people are talking about Western liberal democracies and they're being threatened and they're in the decline, this is what you mean, right? That you provide a society where people can exercise, they can flourish, and it has to be one where religion is tied to reason. And the idea is that God gave you a free will, but you have to have reason and you have to educate it to know how to use it. So rational liberty has to be balanced with the other capabilities, but it, you don't have to be, if you're a feminist, you don't have to be an atheist, even though a lot of religious traditions are sexist. So a lot of feminists are flaming atheists. They think God is just some invention by men <laughs> to overpower women, which there's a good argument for that. Um, all right, so let's see. All right, so I'm gonna call on everybody. You have to have a comment on United Nations capability model and a comment on the arguments, Wollstonecraft's argument. So which part of it did you like the best or not like? Okay, I'm just gonna go, I I'm, I'm think I'm gonna drill you here. Michael, what do you say? Um, specifically about the UN section. Um, um, I don't really know. I mean, I've, I've read this paper and I watched your video and I've commented multiple times. Uh, I just don't have a specific comment about this section. Okay, what about Wollstonecraft's um, argument? Well, I think See, the thing, like, especially with throughout your paper, like, it was pretty obvious that, like, they wanted to keep religion, like, a, they didn't want to just throw out the idea that religion was inherently bad and, and led to all of this sexism, which, like, you, you talked about, like, you, a second ago, you just talked about that as well. Um, but I also have to wonder, like, in, in a world with no religion, um, like, if you took religion completely out of the picture, um, because I think what, what they're arguing is that because religion is still a cornerstone of most belief systems, that you still need to use it as a way to stop um, uh, sexism. To, um, but I, I have to wonder, like, if you didn't have a religion of any capacity, what, like, how equality would look at that point? What do you think? You think it'd be better? Um, I don't know, because it's hard to say because there's definitely like a, a, a component that was like a physical component just in the fact that like men um physically are typically more like strong than women and i think if you go back historically that's definitely been um a way uh, of abuse of power um so i don't know um i wonder if you look at other species like in in the world if you see um if you see any any similar similar patterns. Um. Well, the way this society is, you know, the economy no longer depends upon upper body strength, right? When it did, it was different. Now it really depends upon brains. Right. And then women are equal in their brain capacity. Does that make right. sense, Michael? 
Yes, yes, and I agree there. But I mean, at the at the basis at the start of a civilization, it would not have been that way um, prior to you know getting technology that kind you know to, prior to kind of evening the playing field with technology that we had that we had developed. Yeah, but that's where we are now, right? Right. Yes. No, I agree. Yeah, actually, all over the world too, even in developing countries. Um, so Ryan, what about yeah, well, even in hunter-gatherer societies, men and women are seen often seen as equal, like in tribe settings. Okay. All right. Okay, Jordan, what did you think of the argument or the UN something? Um, I thought that was or Worsen Crafts uh, argument was very valid that education leads to women understanding their rights more, also understanding um, the other side of the spectrum more like uh, when women, and when she was talking about in third world countries, how that would still be beneficial, I agree. Because I think education is the key to a lot of human advancements and understanding like where what we're talking about now, which is where women started and where they are now in society. Okay. With the UN, um, I didn't really have, like, I didn't necessarily see the argument for women's rights in it. I mean, it was there, but I, I didn't feel as strongly about it as it did with the other articles, so. Okay. Tim, what about you? Tim? Okay, so for the argument where, where it said marriage should be friendship based first, uh, I feel like that's valid because it, it, it's, it's been pretty hard to be married to somebody for years, like 10, 20 years and not even be friends with them. That's, I, mean, I think that would be pretty difficult. I, I, I can't speak for myself because I'm not old, but for older people, whenever I see like videos and stuff, they say, well, just communication is the best way to to stay together for that long. So that that for sure is kind of interesting to me because at least now it's kind of changing. So now it's more about uh, money. Hopefully it doesn't go like that then, um, later on. Hopefully that stops soon, but a lot of people are going off of money not really um, friendships and stuff like that. And then for the UN cap capabilities, I don't know why my computer will not let me see it. I, I tried, but it just won't let me, neither of them. Tell me I have to use some apps. Do you think you can be better friends with your spouse if they're educated? Oh, yes. Okay. You have a good understanding with them. Yes. Okay, that was her point, right? Mm -hmm. Um, okay, Zane, what do you think? Um, well, I will start off like with the point that you know you made the, you know, uh, the philosophy that you know women aren't don't have reason, you know, and that's why they shouldn't make you know choices and stuff like that. And how you said that affects you know the whole society whenever you you know are basing the basing off that philosophy. Well, also you know if you know we allow women to you know be educated and you know know their rights, how you know they are just as you know important as men. That also affects the society, and I think that was that kind of stood out to me of how like both of these, so you know, both of the both of the thought processes, you know, they just affect the whole society, and that's kind of what stuck out to me. Okay, Alyssa, did you have anything? Um, yes. As far as the UN thing, uh, the UN article, it made me think back. One time, I was talking about like women's rights with my father, and um he we were talking about like just how the U.S. was developed in other parts of the world and how great it is but to think of how they did that all with only half of the population really like especially in like the U.S. they did it with a quarter I mean it was all just white males that contributed to building our society because others weren't allowed and just how much greater um societies could have been if everyone had been allowed and like you see that in um, parts of the world where women and minorities were able to participate at the beginning, they have certain advantages, but just how um, 
it only hurts everyone if we aren't all able to contribute. And then, go ahead. Oh, and for the other article, I completely agree with how you can't completely alienate religion from it. Because, like, personally, like, I consider myself a feminist, but I'm also a Catholic. And a lot of people think that those um, go against each other. But I know, like, with my own self and, like, with reason, like, I think back to, like, like um, the Virgin Mary, she's very important in Catholicism. And, um, and how, like, with how you got to be friends with your spouse first when the Virgin Mary first like became pregnant with Jesus, it could have been very easy for Joseph just to betray her. You know, she could have been stoned, but like they had to have had some form of a friendship there because he stood by her side and Jesus Christ was able to be born. And so like all of that really like strikes a chord with me because I've always seen them working together while some other feminists, you know, are atheists and like, that's fine. But like personally, I feel like empowered through my religion, especially with how important like the Virgin Mary is. Well, Jesus treated women as equals, right? Mary and Martha, he told Martha to get out of the kitchen and come in the living room and talk about serious things. So it does seem crazy to me. Any other quote you take from the Bible is not Jesus. Uh, So seems nuts to me. Uh, Ryan. Just going off of what Alyssa just said, I am not, I don't label myself as a Christian, but I have a relationship with God. And through my reading with like, through my reading with the Bible and stuff like that, I have not once felt like less than from a man. Like, I don't know. I just, for me, like she said, I feel empowered through the word and like, yeah, it should not be take, taken completely out. Like religion should it be taken completely out. And I can still have like, want equality for women while still having a relationship with God and reading the Bible. Like, I don't think it's got to be one or the other. And I feel like um, religion can mean a lot to a certain person and um, people take it in certain ways. And we don't know why people, you know, will gravitate towards a religion, but it does play a big role in their life. So um, it shouldn't be completely taken out. And um, religion could help promote the idea of women equality, in my opinion, because Jesus says that like he loves all his children. He didn't just say, "I love all my children." That's white and is a man, you know. And so I feel empowered because I, I just like pers- we talked about like um, how we perceive things is like our mindset. And for me, I feel empowered. So therefore, I read the word through empowerment. And so for me. Um, I think that I can do all things because he said that I can do all things through him. And so for me, I feel like I could achieve all things. And so, yeah, it's just how you see it. The other thing is, how do you relate your faith to your consciousness as a citizen, right? As an engaged citizen. So that's controversial too. That's what we did with the youth of Roe, is that people who call themselves Christian really are engaged in public life in really different ways. Um, anyway, I'll go to the next, who hasn't, I haven't called on, oh, Alexis, are you there? Yes, ma'am, I'm right here. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry if you can't see me. I have like the biggest headache. I'm trying to keep it dark. Um, so my, starting with the one saying, um, that religion not religion, um, knowledge about like keep giving women knowledge gives them power of knowing their rights and like like prevents them from being undermined and stuff. And um, my mom always taught me growing up that a, a woman with power is a woman with knowledge because once a woman has knowledge, the world can't deceive her. And I've always stuck by that. She's always told us that we should if we have the power, if we have the ability to learn as much as we can, because that, in a sense, will help us get through it. So I do really believe that um, once a woman has knowledge, she is better off in in any 
society in the US, UK or anything, but I don't believe that it's religion that puts the woman down or at least all religions. I do know lots of religions where the woman is idolized and she is the, um, she's the one, she may be the one that stays at home, but she's the head caretaker. Um, sorry, what's the word? Caretaker. caretaker. Yeah. Like I know in, I might be wrong, but this is personal research. Um, in the Arabic religion, women are usually at home. The men go to work and they work and the women stay home and they take care of the kids in the home. But at the end of the day, the man reports home to his wife. He hands the money to his wife. His wife has control of the money. And like, it basically sets up where um, a king, queen of the household, but the queen is the head. Okay. And okay. she is more powerful than the king, in a sense. Right. I mean, that's, and, yeah, that's the theory. Hopefully it works. Right. It will be working in my household, at least. I. I can't. That's how we'll be working in my household. Right. I. Of course, we both will be working. Yeah, it's just a matter of if you give someone power. I mean, that's what John Stuart Mill was saying. Although the point is that women do have power, and so hopefully, I mean, sometimes these ideologies are what you know, kind of a whitewash for what's actually going on you know mm -hmm. um so hope for the best um i think okay aaron uh what i'm going to do is go to the next point oh men wear the pants yeah his woman tells him which one to put on okay um so let me let me check out the argument from john stuart mill and then i'm going to apply it to race and then i'm going to apply it to homosexuality because I want you to think about the fact that it's all the same arguments. And so this is what's interesting to me, is that why is it difficult to prove that women should be equal? You have to picture the people he's talking to. This would be a radical, radical shift, extreme, the most radical shift of any social shift. Why? It's difficult to prove because of people's feelings. And their feelings conflict with what's reasonable. The influence of social of conditioning. People aren't willing to re-examine their habits. The burden of proof is on those who argue for equality. In other cases, it should be, why should I have to argue for equality? Equality has been is part of the modern world. Um, it's hard to prove everything we're doing is wrong. All right. I've, I'm going to have to go fast through this, but male domination was never initiated after the result of experimentation, right? Nothing else has ever been tried. It was just might makes right. So somebody needs to blow the whistle. What about women accept male domination? Again, I want you to pick your favorite arguments. Well, first of all, they don't accept it. And the second thing is they'll accept as somebody said, they um, all they complain about is whether their husband is is worse than somebody else's husband. Plus, they're afraid to complain. Obviously, they have to go home and sleep with this guy. They're not going to publicly complain about him. So all the causes lead to this um, unlikely that women will ever rebel. Um, but history teaches that We've always had false beliefs and they eventually get recognized. Someone has to be the messenger. Um, in modern societies, people are individuals, free and equal. Um, it's unjust to hinder freedom. The importance of free and open discussion. All right, so this is, this is really important. And that's why we shouldn't be using our free speech to trigger other people and to polarize other people because it's the only way to promote a healthy society is well-intentioned, reasoned uh, discussion. People making an effort to find out what's true or what's best. Um, you can't just base it on experience. You have to figure out how does your experience tie to what's going on in the world? Um, 
Very few men know the characters of their wives because everybody's just playing a role. It's really hard to know who these people are. People adjust to um, just to get along. Um, the policies are contradictory. If women really are by nature intended to be wives and mothers, you don't have to force them, right? Go ahead and give them all this legal freedom and they won't take it. But if you force it, that's an indication that this is not natural, <laughs> that you're, they actually have these capabilities because you're not allowing them to develop it. Um, okay, by forcing women to marry, if you force them to marry, at least marriage ought to be a safe place, a decent way of life. Well, it's not. The guy has absolute power over his wife, over her property, over her children. Um, if she leaves, she has nothing. They can't take the children. They can't take any property. She has no right to get a job. I mean, there's not likely they're going to leave. Um, all right. So the laws have to be made to account for bad men. If you have a good marriage, say, well, you don't have to have a law. Well, you do have to have a law because there are bad men. Um, so that's uh, the way things were set up in Victorian England. It was a relation of despotism. Um, and that he just talks about all the dysfunction. Uh, he also uh, thinks that women have to choose between a career and marriage and family. And this is still a problem throughout the world. It's very hard for women to do both. Um, then the, the laws and social change. There have to be people whose, whose understanding of the laws and society goes beyond their own experience. And they can see how you have to lead the society forward what you need to aim for in the future. And you know, you have to picture what a visionary this was. It was not people's experience. So again, whenever you say my experience is this, you have to get beyond your experience. What does your experience tell you? Um, all right. And then philosophy and religion. And his conclusion is that it's the duty of educated people to envision a better future, right? So even though you often get killed for it, like Jesus and Socrates, um, but the most direct benefit is the happiness of women or the happiness of the oppressed because everybody has a, has a deep drive for a life of rational freedom. Um, and I think that's true. Okay, the next one is race. Now I want you to go through this. So I just use the same outline. Mill didn't do this, but it's the same arguments. Someone's arguing for the equality of the races. Why is it hard to prove? Well, because people's emotions are connected with racism. Their emotions, their feelings are, are irrational. The influence of custom, People are not willing to re-examine their habits. So now you have to argue for racial equality. You really should assume that that's true and argue, give me a reason why these people shouldn't be treated equally. It's hard to prove a negative. It's threatening, right? It was threatening to the people who owned slaves. They couldn't see a better future. All they could see is their own interests being challenged. Um, this idea of romantic ideas, what's natural, what religion, you know, the Bible was used to justify. Somebody has to speak out. It was never initiated after experimentation. Nothing else was tried. Um, we don't have anything to compare it against. It was just might makes right. They had, whites had the power to dominate, so they did. Somebody's got to blow the whistle. What about if they accept? Do they accept white domination? Well, no. They're even now working for equality, right? They're afraid to complain. All the causes lead to them to subjugate their minds. Um, history teaches people have always held false beliefs 
Um, there, it's important to have free and open discussion. Very few people know the characters of their slaves because of course they're not gonna, they're all playing these horrible roles. The policies are contradictory. If, if non-whites are by nature intended to be slaves, you don't have to force it, right? They'll just naturally work for you. <laughs> um, marriage and the family were completely destroyed by slavery. Um, so somebody has to call, call it out. And then religion, again, and philosophy are often used to justify it. It's not justified. And intellectuals, educated people have to point forward. So this is the same with Black Lives Matter. Like we have to envision a better society. We have to point out the systemic racism in our society, housing, education, healthcare. Somebody's gotta call it out and also come up with how can we structure things so the next generation is better off. Um, and again, a life of rational freedom. That's what everybody wants. Now I want to go to homosexuality, right? Same arguments. And the argument is we should treat people with a, a non-binary sexuality um, uh, should not be discriminated against. Why is it difficult to prove? Feelings. The conflict between feelings and what's reasonable, the influence of social institutions. Um, people aren't willing to re examine their habits. The burden of proof ends up on arguing for sexual orientation equality. In other cases, right, for women, it, we've accepted equality. For African Americans, in theory, or non whites, in theory, we've accepted it. Um, but uh, I don't know about you, but at least as of recently, this, this was where people drew the line. Like, why? Why draw the line? It's hard to prove a negative. You don't even know who the people, if whether people you know are gay, are non-binary, uh, which is, they probably are. You know, you don't even know. Um, how do you prove a negative? This romantic thing about God created man and woman, blah, blah, that it's natural. We don't have any idea of what's natural. So research has come out. Some people have this orientation. Um, so then there's religion is used. It's a big bludgeon to um, prevent progress. So you have to think. That's why the Wollstonecraft article, religion does not have to be a conservative crippling you know influence that cripples people cripples progress it doesn't have to be but in a lot of cases it is um so why is it important to speak out it was never initiated as a the a result of experiment there was never any evidence that uh non-binary people would were any less human were any less capable of having meaningful sexual relationships, were any less capable of citizenship, any sort of human activity. Uh, nothing else had been tried. Uh, it was just might makes right. So then you have, well, but, homo but homosexuals accept, sorry, I didn't put, should have non-binary, uh, you know, accept, um, binary domination, right? No, they don't. Um, but they're afraid if they complain, if they come out, obviously they can get killed or um, not get a job or not get housing. I mean, you know, there's discrimination. There's reasons not to bring it up. Um, and then, okay, they're afraid to complain, obviously. So all the causes make it unlikely that they would rebel, but they are anyway, right? Because they just can't live this way. Um, history shows we've held, held fat, false belief. They eventually get recognized. Somebody has to be the messenger. Um, all right. Uh, free choice and competition will lead people to do what they do best. 
we have to release non-binary people so they can flourish like everybody else and we'll all benefit. The importance of free and open discussion. Um, very few heterosexuals even know the characters of the non-heterosexuals because they don't know who they are. They, you know, they're ignorant. So how can you have an opinion about the characteristics of somebody you don't even know who, you, who it is that qualifies? They're inherently contradictory. Um, yeah, this is my question here, is that why would anybody choose to be non-binary? I mean, they're just going to get beaten up, ostracized, despised. I mean, people would never choose that unless they absolutely can't change. It's just what's natural for them. So they decide which is more miserable, to be honest about who I am or to and get despised or beaten up or killed or to live this lie, right? And um, for a long time, when I was over the last 50 years, uh, people stayed in the closet. Um, perhaps, okay, so by forcing them to appear heterosexual, the powerful don't have to be responsible for their abuses of power. Um, but if you give people other options, um, then everybody is accountable for having a decent relationship with their partners. Um, okay, marriage, yeah. Here's another one, marriage. In a modern society, the foundation for the laws is secular. So marriage is a legal institution and you can separate in Europe, you go to the courthouse and get a civil union. You have a civil union and you go to the church and get married. So, um, so we finally made marriage um, equality the law, but it might get overturned at this point. So I do think you need to think about this. Um, it also might get sent back to the states and some states will have marriage or they will have civil unions or whatever. Um, there's no reason to think non-heterosexuals are incapable of long-term committed healthy sexual relations. No evidence that they aren't. Um, and if you give, if you give heterosexuals power, they're going to abuse it, you know? It's unjust. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Children. Um, children can get raised by non-heterosexuals and they're good parents. It really matters if you're abusive or not. It doesn't matter what your sexual orientation is. Um, Let's see, philosophy and religion. Again, religion is once again used to um, mandate a reactionary conservative position that is preventing the, us from progressing and moving forward. Okay, so non-binary uh, people want a life of rational freedom, just like everybody else, because they're just as human as everybody else. Okay, so I do want you to react to that. Um, I'll start with Erin. Did you say my name? I said Aaron and he unmuted. Okay. But I don't sure. know where he is. Um, what's the question exactly? Well, what do you think of the argument? The like which part of it? The end part? Whichever part you want to talk about. I mean like I'm trying to follow along. Does somebody want to start? I mean, if you want to raise your hand. Okay, Jordan, go ahead. 
I disagreed with some of what Stuart was saying because a lot like in America in the early 2000s the original ads to try and legalize gay marriage was all about statistics and facts and what got people to actually like change their mind was about these personal stories and I think that if you don't put in your personal feelings into an argument you're not going to get anyone it's that emotional side that actually gets people to listen and that's okay. like my main issue with what Stuart was saying right so that's something about John Stuart Mill is he is a Apollonian he's a rational right he's giving you a purely rational argument does that make sense I was just going to go off of that and say that, like, I agree with Jordan. Um, I think that's actually, that's something that she's brought up before, is that, like, especially in instances, like, where we want to see, uh, like, changes in, like, uh, in, in civil rights, like, changes in, like, big issues, like, it has to, uh, it has to be something that, that, like, attacks people's emotions, or else, like, we never see any change elicited. Go ahead, Ryan. Also, it doesn't, I mean, it definitely helps it's if, if like it's the exact situation, but even if it's not exactly the same situation, for example, like when we're talking about like gay marriage, if you're going to go and attack one group of people, who's going to be next? Like, is it going to be intercultural relationship? Like it's something that's personal. So I definitely think that like personal experience, like I think it should be a balance, like statistics does definitely help. But then also like having that personal experience kind of hits close to home, even if the person or the viewer um, who's not gay sees it and they see like this whole big story and it's like oh something I can relate to maybe my family didn't want me to be with this person that I'm with now so me, I, they can feel a sense of like uh, they can have empathy for the situation because they went through something not completely the same it's something similar and so I think that that's why it's important to have those type of personal relation uh, not relationships <laughs> personal um, stories to what's going on. Go ahead, Alexis. So picking back off what they just both stated, um, I don't know if y'all ever visited, but the um, Black History Museum up in Washington, D.C. has a lot of, as a section on, based on interracial marriages and gay, gay rights. And it's not known, but when they were doing the, when they were protesting the um the very first black lives matter protest where they were protesting their freedom and all that there were people out there who were protesting gay rights as well they and protesting the right to marry someone outside of their race obviously this hits close to home because i am the product of a biracial marriage um but just seeing the fact that i it hits home to me. I can, what they're saying, it hits home. I can, oh my gosh, I, I could feel that with you. I can support that because I connect on it in a level that is beyond just facts. Facts are just like numbers. I'm not an accountant. I'm not going to be like, oh, facts. I like facts. No, I like, I read books. I like stories. I like hearing, I like hearing, feeling emotion. So a lot of people are going to be like that. They're going to want to hear the the sappy side story that's what gets most people to go I'm hands on all hands on board usually like to talk about that gay rights were because of a black trans woman named Marsha P Johnson who or you know we are it's interconnected because both of those communities understand what it's like to be marginalized for something that you can't help and I think that's part of what they were talking about in the last article which is why it's like you know, it's important to address these issues and talk about them like this in order to understand why it's so important for us to progress as an issue. Like the idea that it's going to be rescinded. I remember when it was put into place in 2016, I was in Boston and all the gay flags came up and it was like a huge moment. But like, I know if it goes back to the States, it's going to be diminished for so many people. All these people who have been married and who are married to their spouse and who love their spouse are going to get rescinded because of this. It's just, it's just a lot. I think for one, it really just shows how reliant our society is on trauma because you have to hear these like gut-wrenching stories to feel moved to make any progress. And like, it's unfortunate that it's an evil necessary we have that um, 
like, oh, you're suffering. So I guess now we'll fix it. That it's not just intuitive that we should fix these things even without it harming people. Um, and that's just what like the article was making me think personally. Kim, go ahead. Well, going off of what Alyssa and Jordan said, I think most of it is just, it gotta be talked about more because no matter who's getting married or anything, it shouldn't really matter. You know what I'm saying? It, it, whatever they want to do, let them be them. We shouldn't have a right to not let not let not let a guy and a guy or a girl and a girl marry each other. Like I don't I just don't see how that makes any sense. And where she was talking about um oh oh man Alyssa just said it ah oh, she said um um oh man. I had a long, I had a long thing in my in my head, and then I said that, and I just forgot everything I was gonna say. I, it was good too, but I just forgot. What did you say, Alyssa? What was that? What did you say? Tim said. I need to the last few things you said. Um, how like, I guess maybe like how mm -hmm. traumatic stories are like a necessary evil. Okay. And okay. I know, I, know like, I know now. I know now. Okay, so about the traumatic stories, I think what it is, I think we talked about it in earlier Zooms. Nobody wants to draw on the past. You got, but you got to know your past to better the future. So nobody really wants to hear the stories about, oh, how Jordan said, the, the, how it first started and all that. They don't really care about that. They just want to know, now let's not do it instead of, well, let's understand it. So it's almost like they want to like forget about history and be like, oh, the, but none of that yes. matters anymore. Yeah. No, I no, no. They no, think it's irrelevant now. They feel like it's irrelevant now. Also, I mean, to me, it's people's arguments in their head. They keep going over these same arguments. And so they ought to figure out what's going to be the next wave of where we have to go in the future and people are going to resist and they're going to use religion and you know to sort of catch yourself like stop doing that we keep doing that does that make sense you guys um well what about here's a problem the relation between white police officers and black men there's a lot of trauma right a lot of trauma and it's on both sides so now what do you do right and i mean i mean i understand the person with the gun is not as trauma but they can be traumatized right they will claim to be i mean i again i just want to grant how do you pull out of it and try to recreate a uh, that's 100 percent racial it has to be how do you how do you break out of it that's the question right i, I, I feel like me personally the the good cops should take accountability of what the bad cops are doing and speak up about it. Because like, for example, the George Floyd thing, there's no way that, that should have happened. That doesn't make any sense. And then there was a mass killer not too long ago. He got in custody safely while some people who are black are getting like crazy. Um, they're, getting, they're getting dealt with all crazy and dying and stuff. And they're not even real criminals. so. That has to be racial motivated. I know. And my point is, how do we get past the emotions and the stories? I think we all just need to, I don't know, sit down and talk and understand. But I just, I don't know. It's hard because there's a lot of trauma, right? Does that make, does that seem fair? Oh, no, it's not fair at all, but. No, does it seem fair to say the reason why this is really hard? Oh it's yeah, the good. trauma. Yeah. They try to forget it, but it keeps reoccurring. It's like an open wound. Great. Okay. All right. Yeah, All right go, go ahead. ahead. Go, go um, ahead, Ryan. But or... like Jordan said, um, it really does. Like the system makes it so hard for good cops to exist, and like. Personally, like I have an uncle who he's a police officer and he actually works for internal affairs. So he's the one that is, you know, um, policing over the cops. And 
like just through like other cops and like media you know like they hate those type of cops because they think they're like traitors but it's just they're there to be in place to make sure that everyone is being treated fairly but the trauma within the system goes so deep that they don't even think that they're on um the cop side like without them you're like we're gonna have more things in the news all these things and like my my uncle he almost went to jail a long time ago I remember because it was before he got into eternal affairs uh sheriff was like taking money from inmates and he had reported it and the sheriff went to the deputy to the DA's office and like said that he was corrupt and like he very easily could have gone to jail that would have been the end of his career and like it's just so crazy how just within like policing in America it seems like they don't want to get better Ryan. On the top, well, I've not been muted. I'm sorry. Um, on the topic of um, the fact that like cops could be like corrupt and not corrupt, um, I think there are good cops out there, but usually they're put in danger because they're a good cop. Like they're surrounded by people who will do anything and any anything and everything to get ahead, but. Um, the moment they're like the moment they see something corrupt, they don't know who all is corrupt. So the moment they try to, like she said, they could go to jail for just saying, "Hey, this cop, such and such, is corrupt." Somebody else. Well, I can um, go back to what she's saying. I think what it is, they're trying to um, um, like how they had Black Lives Matter then they somehow made a thing called Blue Lives Matter, which makes no sense. Nobody's blue. They're just cops. They're trying to protect themselves, protect each other. So they won't go against each other no matter what. So if a corrupt cop, you see a corrupt cop, now you're just in danger. Like, well, they just it's all like almost like a brotherhood. You don't want to go against the grain. Yeah. Ryan? Yes. Well, speaking on Pat, um, for me, I just feel like one of the bigger issues is like generalization. It's like because it's misinterpretation and then also not a, no accountability. But then you have to also look at the implications. Like they all have families that they have to like provide for. And if, for the example, uh, Alyssa's story, like he could have chosen the easy way out and just like not said anything, but yet he jeopardized his whole like career. You know what I'm saying? And he could have possibly like his life. I mean, and it's up to that person whether they want to stick up and and you know go against the green and I personally would be somebody who would speak up against it but not everybody is in the same position or you could say I guess there is a sense of privilege it does that you have if you have the ability to speak up because like I feel like like as much as like your your heart could tell you like hey speak up this is wrong you also like have to realize like what if you become homeless and you have like literally no money to even eat and like all of this stuff and you you know you ruin your family's lives because you can't provide because you lose your job but I think in terms of like the blue lives matter thing I think it's like hard because at least from my experience what I've heard from people talk about like people who has like parents that's like in the like that's cops and stuff they felt like attacked because a lot of people like just said in general like all cops are bad if you are a cop and you don't speak against what a certain cop did therefore you're bad or if you're even still a cop and you didn't resign then you're supporting the system so i feel like it's generalization because like i don't think all cops are bad i think there's bad cops and there's i mean like i think there's bad people there's good people and it's up to everybody else like you know but i think there's like a fine line because i also feel like for me personally if i see somebody getting bullied and i don't speak up on it then i feel like i'm just as bad so like for me personally, that's my morals, but they, that might not be the same, per, like another person's morals. Like, you know, some, somebody else might not, might be in a different position as me. And I don't realize, I mean, I don't understand why somebody wouldn't speak up against, for example, the George Floyd situation. I wouldn't understand why they would not. But at the same time, it's like, I also don't understand what's going on in their life to like judge them about it. So that's just my opinion. on right. That might have to do with, um, just um it's really just a battle for your morals really do you believe on being a good person and helping out or do you believe on well i gotta 
um, save for my family and all that. So it's it's, it's really a, it's like a gamble almost. You know, if you speak up, you might get demoted or get fired. But then, is it kind of worth it? Because uh, life could have been saved. So it's like you never know what's gonna happen. But it's it's like a it's like um like a battle in your head basically about what what can happen, what the outcomes, what you should do. So Aaron, go ahead. Like speaking on like what they're saying about like just the tensions and the trauma and everything, like they're making like, like everyone's kind of made really good points regarding everything about that. Like it's just like one of those situations that it's like they're saying, it's just kind of rooted in kind of the police force. And like we've seen like throughout, I guess like the history of the United States, it's always been kind of like controlling people and controlling minorities. And like you like in LA with the Watt riots and everything like that, like that kind of, like that's probably one of the biggest incidences we've seen with it. And like it caused like LA to go crazy. And I mean, like, and nothing's really ever really changed. So like, that's another thing is like, how do we change it? Like, honestly, like, how do we change it? Is my question. I, I think my biggest problem with these issues is that like, you can take off the uniform, you can't take off your skin. That's number one. So blue lives aren't really lives, they're a uniform. And on top of that, Police are often complicit in other crimes simply because of the laws put in place that allow them to be, like stop and frisk. That is a law that's directly racially biased and has been used to be racially biased. On top of that, there are laws put in place where police cannot be prosecuted if they do commit a crime. And I think all that culminates in there's too much ability for the police to be corrupt and to use that corruption to their advantage. And without the training that they need, like it takes, I, I forget how long the training is. It takes so little time to be a cop it, compared to be a, a hairdresser. It takes longer to get a hairdressing license than it does to get a police, like get a badge. That's insane. I think that in order to, like they have seen um, benefits in hiring within a community for community-based policing. But even that has some issues based on like biases that we have in place. Yeah, well, and also, what do they learn in those police academies? I read, you know, in one of them, you learn, shoot first, you know? Uh, so the academy sort of teaches you to defend yourself. Um, so my point for bringing this up was that I think with the gay thing, it was empathy and it was um, compassion and <coughs> And it was the trauma that a gay person has, and they they seem innocent. You you know you start. The thing is that this problem also people have stories, and stories alone, like trying to figure out how to fix the system or at least improve it. I I mean I think it's I don't pretend to know anything. I just think there's a lot of trauma there and a lot of fear, and. That's why it's hard to figure out. But go ahead, Michael. Um, just to speak on like homosexual marriage, because um, like that the article did cite like using the facts, and we talked about using emotion. But even like factually, like um, uh, like when I was in a uh, what class was it? Maybe it was child and adolescent development, or maybe it was just human development. I don't know. A psych a psychology course here, um, like gay gay homosexual parents are better, like they are, tend to be better parents than than straight couples. Like, even if you look at the facts, like a lot of times like homosexual like parents are better, um, probably because internally they have to hold themselves to better uh, standards just because it, if, if they didn't, you know, the, the, the blowback would be immense. Possibly, also maybe they know what it feels like to be bullied so they wouldn't be uh aggressive toward their kids uh they'd be more nurturing um empathetic you know. more empathetic what? more empathetic it's 
Yeah. It's also the fact that they have to go through an entire process that could take up to like a year to three, maybe four or five to get the kid. That's after deciding they want the kid. Okay. And having the proof that they can provide for the kid. Like a lot of straight couples just end up having the kid and they're like, oh, now I have this child, whether I want it or not. Yeah, there's no criteria. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's true too. So, okay. So, um, we're wrapping it up for today. Now I do have some students that I would like if they have time to, um, work with me on their papers. Otherwise, yeah, the adoption system needs work. Yeah. The foster care system needs work. Um, Okay, so um, so there were some people that I I could work with you with you on your first paper. On the other hand, we have posts due and we have another paper due. So um, hang in there and just keep going. Now I I've, I've decided basically that instead of having four papers and a final, you could just hand in. Um, three papers, right? You can skip a paper, that's fine. Um, <laughs> because I know it's a lot, but when you write your post, here's another thing, you really need to either directly quote something from the reading or make it very clear to me that you did read it. Because sometimes people's posts are reacting and they write things they could have written if they hadn't read the assignment. So you definitely do not want to communicate that to the professor. <laughs> you really need to, to show that you are running through the line of reasoning in the assignment. Go ahead, Ryan. Hi, you know, for the paper that's usually due on Sunday, um, do you still want that due on Sunday? Because I'm to be honest, like I did not write that. I just turned in my other paper yesterday. But usually they're due on Sundays, right? And I'm still just trying to make revisions on the first uh, the, well, I don't care. I'm not going to grade it lower. I, oh. Okay. The, the thing about it is if you get behind, you're going to be in trouble. So I don't really need to punish you in addition to that because you're going to have to go back and rethink whatever it is. And that'll take a lot of time. So I would just advise you to, to stay on top of it. Stay on top of the work. Um, and yeah, go ahead, Alexis. Um, I You commented on one of mine asking when we can have our conference. Yeah. I, I commented back and you never responded. Okay. So I just want to let you know that I commented on it so we could talk about it. Do you have a time? I do. I'm free. So I have to go. So I have family downstairs right now. Okay. So I can't do talk right now. Okay. But I can talk either... Sunday and like Sunday afternoon or like well Sunday night or Monday like an hour before class okay all right okay I'm I free anytime. yeah I'm free anytime. yeah I'm, I'm free anytime to talk about it. I ain't got much going on can you hear me? Well, what what time is a good time for you anytime 